Okay, um, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, this evening session, uh, evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are, <laughs> uh, uh, session uh, of uh, the last week of the quantum field theory and representation theory uh, program. And uh, we are delighted to start a new course uh, of lectures uh, uh, with uh, Professor Mina Aganaje from uh, UC Berkeley. And she'll be telling us about her work on not categorification from mirror symmetry. Over to you, okay. Mina. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for, uh, for joining us. Um, well, um, so uh, these lectures will be, uh, as I, I mentioned in the, in the little abstract, uh, they, are, they are based on the two papers, one which appeared this year and one uh, last year, and a little bit of uh, things beyond. Uh, let me see if I can change the slides. Okay. So in 98, uh, Kovanov showed that there is a deeper structure that underlies uh, the link invariant uh, discovered by Jones in 85. Um, Jones associated to a link in R3, a polynomial in one variable. The polynomial is a link invariant, uh, which means that links with different values of the polynomial can be smoothly deformed into each other. Uh, moreover, the coefficients of this polynomial always turn out to be integers. It, Jones defined it in a simple way by um, how it changes as uh, uh, you cross a pair of strands and the value for the unknown. So it's very simple to compute. Kovanov showed uh, that uh, strikingly, one can uh, recover the Jones polynomial as a shadow of a much deeper cohomology theory, which assigns to a link a collection of uh, vector spaces graded by uh, the fermion number and um, a second equivariant grading whose uh, graded Euler characteristic uh, turned out to be, uh, is the Jones polynomial. Uh, but uh, the vector spaces themselves turned out to be link invariants, not just the Euler characteristic. What um, the problem Kovanov initiated is to find a physical or um, at least a geometric meaning of Kovanov homology, one that works uniformly for all gauge groups. Um, the relation of Jones's um, polynomial uh, to physics was explained by um, Edward Witten in 89. He showed that the Jones polynomial comes from Trans-Hymen's theory with gauge group ICU2 and uh, links colored by its fundamental representation. The parameter Q of the Jones polynomial is uh, they're related by um, uh, to the level of uh, Trans-Hymen's theory as, as follows. So this placed the Jones polynomial into a more general framework which one gets by uh, considering Simon's theory based on um, differently algebras and by varying um, representations coloring the knots. So I'll uh, explain in these lectures uh, that Kovanov homologies also have uh, origin in physics, which places them in, into a more general framework. Um, in fact, um, we'll discover from string theory two different solutions to this knot categorification problem. The first is based on a category of B-type brains on a, social, on a certain very special class of hyperkähler manifolds, which uh, play a role in uh, geometric Langlands. Recently, uh, Ben Webster proved that uh, the approach that um, ultimately comes from string theory is equivalent to his earlier purely algebraic approach based on uh, what are called um, KLRW algebras after Kovanov, Lauda, Roquian himself. Uh, Moreover, he showed um, that um, one gets an invariant that generalizes to invariant, homological invariant of links in R2 times S1. Um, the second approach I'll tell you about is based on a category of A brains, um, which is um, related to the first. So the second approach is related to the first by um, what I'll call equivariant homological mirror symmetry. Um, Homological mirror symmetry is an equivalence of categories. Equivariant homological mirror symmetry is not an equivalence of categories, but it's a correspondence of objects and morphisms between them. Um, the fact that they're not equivalent is good because it will turn out that um, the second approach also has an algebraic description by a version of KRLW algebras, which is much simpler and completely new. Um, this will ultimately make the theory far more tractable. Um, 
in addition um, to the two geometric approaches, which are the main subject of these lectures, there is a third approach to the problem, um, which uh, also originates from physics due to um, Edward Witten. In fact, all three approaches, the two geometric ones and the one due to Witten, have the same string theory origin. So what we'll end up with um, is sort of a uniform picture of the origin of this problem and um, a significant better understanding of um, how to solve it. Now, uh, the reason um, transcendence not invariants are uh, interesting for me is not so much that um, uh, not invariants and, and um, the knots and their invariants are interesting, but rather um, because of the wealth of math and physics connections one um, gets to discover once you understand it. The fact that the structure arises from a deeper theory um, will no doubt lead to many more connections. We'll see one of them here to solvable but highly non-trivial examples of homological mirror symmetry, which connected to representation theory. So uh, I divided this up into chapters so, <laughs> to make it sort of manageable. So uh, in the 89 paper, in the same 89 paper, um, Jones, uh, Witten also showed uh, that underlying transhumanist theory is a two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, we'll take this uh, rather than transhumanist theory as the starting point. Uh, in some ways, um, one can view the relation of the two geometric approaches I'll describe to Witten's approach as akin to relation of transhumanist theory to its conformal field theory, uh, though the analogy is not perfect. Um, Conformal field theory, the conformal field theory one needs for this um, has an affine Lie algebra symmetry obtained as a central extension of the loop algebra of G, where uh, one fixes the central element uh, to be the level kappa. To eventually get invariants of knots in R3 or S3, uh, one would typically start with the Riemann surface, which is uh, simply a complex plane with punctures. It's equivalent, but better for our purpose, uh, to take the Riemann surface to be an infinite punctured cylinder. Um, the punctures are labeled by uh, representations of G, and um, two types of representations will play a role for us. To so puncture at a finite point um, on the Riemann surface on the cylinder, we'll associate a finite dimensional representation of G, uh, which will moreover take to be minuscule. Minuscule representations are a subset of fundamental representations. So for example, all fundamental representations of SUN are minuscule. They are the representations with the property that um, any weight is in the wild group orbit of the fundamental weight. Um, so to the punctures at the two ends at infinity, um, we'll associate a pair of infinite dimensional Verman modular representations whose um, highest weight vectors are given by generic uh, weights of the Lie algebra. Uh, one can view this Riemann surface as obtained by uh, suing from um, three puncture spheres. Conformal field theory associates the three puncture sphere chiral vertex operator, which um, acts as an intertwiner between a pair of Verman modular representations. Um, to a Riemann surface with punctures, conformal field theory associates, associates a conformal block obtained by uh, sewing chiral vertex operators. In doing so, um, you get to make choices of intermediate Verma modular representations. So this construction doesn't give a single conformal block but a whole vector space. Now, rather than characterizing conformal blocks in terms of uh, vertex operators and sewing, one can describe them as solutions to a differential equation. The equation that they solve um, is the equation uh, discovered by Knizhnik and Zemologikov in uh, 84. More precisely, the specific flavor of this equation we need is known as uh, the KZ equation of trigonometric type because we're thinking of the Riemann surface as an infinite cylinder. Uh, the coefficients on the right-hand side are given by um, what are called classical R matrices of the Lie algebra, um, which are constructed in the following way. Now, um, 
Conformal blocks are obtained by uh, sewing chiral vertex operators are arise as solutions of this case equation, which are analytic in a specific chamber uh, corresponding to a choice of ordering of vertex operators. By varying positions of uh, vertex operators on the Riemann surface as a function of time, um, we get a colored braid in the Riemann surface times time. This um, leads to a monodromy problem, which is to analytically continue the fundamental solution uh, to the Casey equation along the path described by the braid. Monodromy along the path um, depends only on a homotopy type. So the resulting um, monodromy matrix is the invariant of a colored braid. This monodromy problem um, was um, solved by Tsuchiya and Kanye for um, SU2 first in 88. And uh, in the general case um, was done by Dreenfeld and Kono in 89. Um, they uh, show that monodromy matrix that reorders a neighboring pair of vertex operators is um, given, well, it's given in terms of a product of R matrices of the quantum group um, corresponding to G. This quantum group symmetry isn't manifest anywhere in the original formulation of the problem, starting with either conformal field theory or with Simon's theory. One discovers it um, uh, once only when you solve the problem exactly. So that's a general feature of quantum symmetries. Um, action uh, by monodromies turns the space of conformal blocks into a module for um, the quantum group um, in a representation, which is a tensor which product of all representations associated with the vertices, with the um, insertions, um, viewed here as a representation of the quantum group. Um, we'll denote, we won't make the distinction between the representation of the quantum group and the representation of G, um, because in particular, it, um, here they turn out to have the same dimensions. In fact, uh, monodromy acts irreducibly only in the subspace of um, the representation of a fixed weight. Uh, that weight uh, corresponds to um, studying conformal blocks of the type we started out with, where which weight you end up, where the weight is fixed by the difference of our module weights at the two, um, at the two punctures at infinity. So the way you want to think about it is that uh, one of the Ravan module weights is a um, rank R complex vector to choose. And um, the other is determined by the chosen weight in the weight nu in the total weight subspace. Anyway, um, so the, uh, this perspective um, leads to quantum invariance, not only of um, braids, but knots and links as well. You can represent any link uh, as a closure of some braid. The corresponding quantum link invariant is a matrix element of the braiding matrix taken between a pair of conformal blocks that correspond to the top and the bottom. The conformal blocks um, uh, that, uh, that serve as caps and the caps are very special solutions of the Casey equation, which describe pairs of vertex operators colored by complex conjugate representations, which come together and fuse to the identity. So in this way, uh, both braiding and fusion of conformal field theory plays a, an important role in the story. Uh, to categorify quantum knot invariants, one would like to associate to a space of conformal blocks at a fixed time slice, a bi-graded category, um, graded by the fermion number and, and an additional equivariant grading to keep track of Q, and to each conformal block, an object of that category. To braids, We'd like to associate functors between the categories corresponding to the top and the bottom. Moreover, we'd like to do it in a way that recovers quantum knot invariance and quantum decategorification. That's what the problem means. Now, in typical approach to the problem, one um, proceeds by coming up with a category and then working to prove that decategorification gives the quantum knot invariance when set out to categorify. In other words, it's guesswork. Uh, a virtue of both of the approaches um, I'll describe is that the second step is automatic. One of the virtues. 
Um, now, a starting point uh, for us will be a geometric realization of the Knizhnik demological equation. So uh, now I'll describe how uh, we get KZ equation in the form of blocks from geometry, and more precisely, more importantly, from supersymmetric quantum field theory. Um, for the time being, um, uh, probably until the end of the last lecture, uh, we'll specialize uh, G uh, to be a simple Lewis Lie algebra. So it's of 80 types. It turns out that the KZ equation is a quantum differential equation of a certain um, holomorphic symplectic manifold. That's a, a symplectic manifold um, equipped with a nowhere vanishing uh, two comma zero form. Uh, the result has uh, been proven recently by Ivan Danilenko in his thesis. Uh, Ivan is a uh, postdoc at Berkeley. Um, quantum differential equation of a Kähler manifold um, is an equation for flat sections of a connection on a vector space, uh, on, a, so on a vector bundle over its complexified Kähler moduli. The fibers of this vector bundle are the cohomology groups. Um, the connection itself is uh, defined by, um, in terms of what's called quantum multiplication by divisors. The quantum multiplication um, originates from gromov witten theory or the topological A model of X as um, the first term is simply uh, the classical product on, on the cohomology and the subsequent terms are given by um, um, works in distant time corrections of the A model. The, just as the KZ equation is central for many questions in representation theory, this quantum differential equation is central for many modern questions in algebraic geometry and in mirror symmetry. Um, so in some ways, um, the, the starting point for the whole story is a new connection uh, between these two areas, which comes from identifying the two equations. Uh, to get a quantum differential equation to coincide with the KZ equation, um, solved by conformal blocks um, that we started out with, uh, this X has to be very special. Uh, one way, um, the manifold we need can be described as a moduli space of uh, G monopoles with uh, prescribed Dirac singularities on R3. Uh, G here is a Lie group of adjoint type with Lie algebra little g. Um, for every vertex operator, we'll place a, a, a singular Dirac monopole um, at uh, the origin of C. So we'll break up R3 into R times C. We'll place the singular monopole at the origin of C and at the corresponding point on R. That's the point obtained by uh, forgetting the circle in the Riemann surface. We'll take um, charge of the singular monopole to be um, the co-weight of little g related to the highest weight um, uh, of LG of the, of the representation coloring the vertex operator by Langlands duality. The choice of uh, which weight subspace the conformal blocks um, transform in or take values in determines the total monopole charge, including that of smooth monopoles. Now, often, in, in fact, that's how we started out, in studying link invariants, we'll start with a compact Lie group and not as what we've done so far uh, with this Lie algebra. The Lie group, of course, is the uh, transimus gauge group. Uh, then um, the group G, whose moduli space um, gives rise to X, whose monopole moduli space gives rise to X, and the transimus gauge group um, are related by Langlands correspondence. <coughs> The Langlands correspondence identifies the co-character lattice of um, G with the character lattice of LG and vice versa. In the gauge theory context, the co-character lattice of G labels the charges of um, heavy uh, uh, Dirac type monopoles. Uh, the character lattice of LG uh, labels the charges of heavy, par heavy particles charged electrically under, the, under LG. Um, so in Trasimus theory, uh, we naturally view knots in three-dimensional space as, as paths of heavy particles charged under LG. 
And yet to obtain their link invariance, we'll use a description in which the very same heavy particles arise as Dirac monopoles of the langlais dill group. Now, uh, the reason why this is the case um, will be explained in the last lecture. Now, in practice, we lose nothing by taking, by, by taking the character lattice of LG to be as large as possible. So it coincides with the weight lattice of LG. Then LG, the group, is simply connected and um, the Langlet's dual group is of adjoint type, which is what we assumed. So for example, uh, uh, for the Lie algebra SU2, we will take to get the carbonyl homology or the Jones polynomial, we take LG to be SU2 and then G is SO3. Um, So uh, the charge, uh, to summarize, the charge of a singular G monopole gets identified by the Langlands correspondence with the highest weight of the representation that colors the corresponding strand of a link. So our manifold is um, obtained by fixing the data of all the singular monopoles. So in particular, the positions on R3 are fixed and adding smooth monopoles so that so that the total monopole charge is a dominant weight nu of G. <clears throat> um, the restriction to dominant weights uh, is um, mainly because those are the only ones that are relevant for the non-theory applications we are after. And also some aspects of the description of X we are using um, uh, work only in that case, um, as it will become clear in a moment. The monopole moduli space, uh, so the mo this monopole moduli space can then be thought of, since we are fixing positions of singular monopoles, can be thought of as parameterized in part by positions of smooth monopoles in R3. Um, and um, um, whereas the singular positions of singular monopoles are the metric moduli. Uh, the manifold X is um, holomorphic symplectic, so it has hypercular structure. Uh, the split of R3 into R times C is, um, uh, in, um, in fact, the choice of complex structure on X. Uh, and we'll choose it so that the positions of singular monopoles on R are the real Kähler moduli, whereas uh, their positions on C are complex structure moduli. Um, so, in particular, nothing interesting happens on this extra complex plane. All the singular monopoles add origin and all the complex structure moduli turn off. So, because the positions of monopoles uh, on the real line are Kähler moduli, the choice of ordering of monopoles is a choice of a chamber in Kähler moduli. And uh, we'll record this in a vector nu. Okay? It's the vector of highest weights of vertex operators in order in which they appear on the Riemann surface. <clears throat> for X to be smooth, uh, it's not enough for singular monopoles to be at distinct points on, on the real line, because one can always interpret this picture as obtained by colliding a larger number of singular monopoles. It turns out that for um, X to be smooth, we need, in addition, um, to positions of singular monopoles that are to be generic, we need, in addition, that every um, um, representation is um, um, associated to the puncture as minuscule. So, um, okay. Now, our manifold has several other useful descriptions. Uh, to mathematicians, the best known one is um, as a resolution of um, um, uh, a certain um, transversal slice in the affine Grassmannian of G. Um, the labeling here is uh, uh, this vector nu that encodes the charges of singular monopoles as they appear on the real line, and nu is the total monopole charge. I will not dis uh, explain this description in, in, uh, in great detail because if you haven't seen it so far, it's too hard to swallow. Uh, but uh, it suffice to know that um, the description in terms of um, 
th this resolution of a transversal slice in a fine Grassmannian arises uh, by thinking about singular G monopoles on R times C as a sequence of Hecke modifications of holomorphic G bundles on C parameterized by R. Um, and uh, in particular, the loop variable of the fine Grassmannian is the coordinate on this um, complex plane C in R3. The connection between the two descriptions is explained in the paper by um, Kapustin and Witten. Um, to physicists, um, the same X. Ah, and um, the, the restriction to dominant, to dominant weights uh, in particular enters uh, for this connection to um, the resolution of a transversal slice in a fine Grassmannian to hope. Um, there is a there is a modified version of the construction in terms of uh, due to uh, Braverman, uh, Finkelberg, Finkelberg, and Nakajima, uh, but it's just not, it's a more modern Afangrismanian slice that works even when nu is not a dominant weight. So, physicists, finally, um, X is a Coulomb branch of a certain three dimensional quiver gauge theory where uh, the singular with n equals to four supersymmetry. Uh, where the singular and smooth monopole charges determine the um, gauge and um, flavor, the ranks of the gauge and flavor symmetry groups. Um, so in particular, um, which vertex operators you put uh, determines the flavor symmetry group. And uh, what is the total weight new subspace you study um, uh, is uh, determined by uh, uh, the gauge group. Now, because X is holomorphic symplectic, it's, um, it's hypercalar, uh, it's, the quantum cohomology uh, would be trivial. It's trivial at the outset. Um, to make it non-trivial, we have to work equivariantly. Uh, we have to break supersymmetry in some way from N equals to four to half of that. We'll do this by uh, working equivariantly with respect to a torus section that scales the holomorphic symplectic form with weight Q. Uh, that weight is the same um, uh, variable, the weight Q is the same variable of not invariance. Um, the reason we chose all the singular monopoles to be uh, at the origin of C is in order for this to be a symmetry. The scaling of the holomorphic symplectic form is related to the rotations of this, um, of this complex C plane by the same parameter Q. Um, in fact, um, to get the quantum differential equation to exactly coincide with the Keynesian epistemological equation solved by the conformal blocks we started out with, we in fact have to introduce additional parameters associated with the choice of this Vermont, one of the Vermont modules. Um, and um, to do this, uh, we'll need to work with respect to a, a full torus of U1 symmetries of X. Um, the, uh, the rank G worth of them um, uh, come from uh, the maximal torus of, uh, of G. Okay, so. Now, um, does all the ingredients in the conformal block have a geometric interpretation in terms of X, starting with relative positions of punctures on the Riemann surface which are the complexified Kähler modular of X. Uh, in fact, um, here we understand why we took the Riemann surface to be a cylinder rather than a plane. It's because uh, the B fields that pair with the real Kähler moduli um, to give you complex ones are periodic. So while position of, a, of vertex operators along um, the radial direction of the cylinder a Kähler modular, a real Kähler modular of X, the positions along the circle come from the B field, which uh, complexifies the Kähler form. Okay. Um, now, the fact that Kähler's equation has a geometric interpretation as a quantum differential equation of X implies that conformal blocks also have a geometric interpretation. Um, the solutions of, of the quantum differential equation are known as um, given tells um, J functions or um, vertex functions. Um, in mo vertex function is a more modern terminology, but anyway, given to call them the J functions. 
So they're given to us J functions of X computed by T equivariant gram of Witten theory. There are um, equivariant counts uh, of holomorphic maps of all degrees from a domain curve, um, which is a priori uh, a P1 with two marked points to X. Now, while it's, the domain is a priori P1 with two marked points, it's better to think about the two marked points as asymmetrically, to think of uh, the domain curve as an infinite cigar with a circle boundary at infinity. Um, the boundary data is a choice of a K-theory class, equivariant K-theory class. Um, it determines which solution the, of the K-Z equation the J function or the vertex function computes. Uh, insertions of cohomology, equivariant cohomology classes at the origin of this long cigar um, make um, the, the J function into a vector. This is a good thing because conformal blocks are also vectors. And in fact, uh, geometric Satake correspondence identifies uh, the cohomology of um, of X, uh, equivariant cohomology of X, with the weight new subspace of the representation of G, um, tensor product of all the representations associated with, um, with the vertex operators. So this way, um, the J function and conformal blocks take values in the, in the, in the same vector space. Now, this geometric interpretation of um, conformal blocks and the KZ equation in terms of X has more information than simply a reinterpretation. Uh, uh, yes, so I, I just now saw a question. Yes, so all of our representations are minuscule. We choose them to be so that for the X to be smooth. This may have been from, actually it's not, it's not from that long ago, good. Okay, so. Um, so the reason we have more information is because underlying gram of Witten theory is a two-dimensional supersymmetric sigma model on X. Um, the sigma model describes all maps from D to X, not just the holomorphic ones. The physical meaning of the J function or the vertex function is as a partition function of the supersymmetric sigma model uh, with target X on D, where in the interior of this long cigar, we preserve supersymmetry by an A-type topological twist. So the partition function is computed by A model or gram of witten theory of X. However, at the circle boundary at infinity, we will place a B-type boundary condition. Because the cigar has infinite length, A-type supersymmetry in the interior is compatible with any supersymmetry on the boundary, even of B-type. Now, this AB type mix is characteristic of central charges of brains. And uh, as we'll, um, uh, um, we'll elaborate on momentarily. Um, the boundary conditions form a category and a category of boundary conditions of a sigma model in X. Uh, preserving B-type supersymmetry and working equivariantly with respect to T is known as the derived category of T equivariant coherent sheaves. Um, the fact that the two coincide is uh, due to works of um, Aspinwall and Lawrence, Douglas, and um, also um, recent works of Hori and collaborators who explain this in great detail. Um, picking a, a B-type brain as a boundary condition and infinity the supersymmetric partition function is given to us J function, which depends on the brain only through its charge, that corresponding equivariant K-theory class. However, while the answer for the partition function depends only on the charge of the brain, only on the K-theory class, not on the brain itself, the underlying sigma model needs an actual brain, an actual object of the derived category to serve as a boundary condition. Now, uh, a braid has a geometric interpretation as a path in complexified Kähler moduli that avoids singularities. Uh, because uh, complexified Kähler moduli of X 
are the relative positions of punctures on the Riemann surface. The monodromy uh, of the quantum differential equation along the path in Kähler modular corresponding to the braid is the, gives a geometric realization of the quantum group action on the space of conformal blocks. Now, uh, from the sigma model perspective, uh, monodromy is realized by letting the moduli of the theory vary according to the braid in the neighborhood of the boundary at infinity, where um, the direction along the cigar coincides um, with the time along the braid. Similar problems were um, studied by Tchaikovsky and Baffer. Um, by asking how monodromy acts on a quantum state, um, say at S is zero, where S is time along the braid, uh, the state that's produced by the path integral over the cigar, so um, one gets a very phase type problem, um, similar to the one studied um, by Tchaikovsky and Baffer. The solution um, of the problem is a linear map, um, the monodromy of um, the quantum differential equation acting on the K-theory class of the brain. It follows that um, sigma model on the annulus where time runs along the annulus and moduli vary according to the braid computes the matrix element of the monodromy between pairs of conformal blocks picked out by um, beta brains at the two boundaries. In fact, we can take all the variation of moduli to happen near one of two boundaries at the expense of changing the boundary condition. This change in the boundary condition um, is uh, action of braid group on objects of the derived category. And these actions, uh, because we are very in Kähler moduli on which um, B model doesn't depend, that action is by auto equivalences of the derived category. Uh, now, while the whole category of brains um, would come back to itself, you go around a uh, closed loop in a parameter space, um, the objects themselves don't come back to themselves. So they're not invariant. <clears throat> Um, now, the, very, we, the signal model in the very same annulus, where we, we, we instead think of time as running around the circle, computes the index of the supercharge preserved by the two brains, per definition. Now, the supercharge preserved by the two brains is the B-type supercharge, and the cohomology uh, of that supercharge on the interval is computed by the derived category as its very most basic ingredient, the space of morphisms between the pair of brains or the space of supersymmetric ground states. Um, the Euler characteristic of the homology theory, where we close up uh, the strip into an annulus, thus manifestly computes the monodromy matrix element because we can think of either direction as time. So what we've learned is that derived equivalences <clears throat> um, manifestly categorify uh, the monodromy matrix of the Casey equation. This is a physics explanation of a very difficult theorem um, of Bezrukovnikov and, and Okunkov, which uh, uses quantization of X in characteristic P. In general, one may have more than one break group action in the derived category. Uh, mathematicians think of derived equivalences as Fourier, Fourier Mokai transforms. Now, sigma model origin of our theory spells out exactly which derived equivalence factor we're getting. By its origin in the sigma model, um, these derived equivalences come from variation of stability condition on the derived category. The stability condition defined, um, the stability condition is defined with respect to central charge, which is a closed cousin of conformal blocks or J functions. This vertex function or J function get, generalizes the central charge function 
in two different ways. Firstly, vertex functions are vectors. They are, we made them vectors by inserting equivariant cohomology classes at the origin of this long cigar. And secondly, they depend on equivariant parameters of the T action and X. Undoing the first uh, generalization, so placing no insertion at the origin, we get a scalar analog of conformal block, a very canonical one, um, which still, however, depends on equivariant parameters. It's, so being scalar, so we'll call it the equivariant central charge function. <clears throat> These equivariant central charge function and their more famous cousins, conformal blocks, have exactly the same monodromy because they differ only at the data at the origin, whereas monodromies act at infinity of the cigar. <clears throat> Conversely, just from perspective of a differential equation, monodromy mixes up its solutions, while as insertions of cohomology classes um, acts <laughs> on the other side of the fundamental solution. Um, the central charge function that provides the stability condition uh, on the category of B-brains is obtained from this equivariant charge, central charge, by simply setting the T-equivariant parameters to zero, working non-equivariantly. Um, we can do this naively for any brain of compact support. The, the story is, for brains which are non-compact, uh, so conformal blocks are always the convergent functions. Whereas if you have a non-compact brain, um, the central charge will diverge. Um, and um, for non-compact brains, this interplay between equivariant central charge and the ordinary one can be used to, pr to produce a very canonical regulator, um, thereby defining the stability condition, even on non-compact brains, which is in general a hard thing to do. But here we have a canonical such definition. Anyway, so the stability, not worrying about non-compact brains, the stability condition um, defined um, with respect to the central charge function is known as the pi stability, the central charge function, which I just described, computed by um, the sigma model on this very long cigar with a B-type brain at infinity is um, known as the pi stability central charge discovered by Douglas. Now, in our case, uh, in general, stability conditions that come from pi stability central charges are very complicated because this function itself is complicated. Now, in our, say, for example, in a quintic, in our case, X is hypercalic. So the exact central charge uh, doesn't receive any instant time corrections. In fact, uh, the exact central charge function can be uh, given in terms of classical geometry by the following formula. Um, in, so in, um, in general, for, for just semi-classical approximation to central charge functions, there are such things like gamma classes that enter. Here, there is no such thing by hypercularity of X. The exact formula is just this. It only involves the square root of the top class. Now, for a brain supported on a homomorphic Lagrangian um, in, in X, um, with some vector bundle over it, the formula becomes even simpler. So it becomes just this. Or if you don't have any vector bundle, the formula, the central charge function is simply the volume of the brain, the complexified volume of the brain, because the only contribution you get comes from uh, the complexified Kähler form. The fact that, okay, uh, now, in fact, working equivariantly, brains supported on such homomorphic Lagrangians generate the entire derived category. Um, in any fixed chamber in Kähler moduli, they are the, the semi-stable brains, the physical brains um, in the, what's called the abelian heart of the derived category, whose central charge is in the upper half uh, of the complex Z plane, and from which you can get any other brain in the derived category by binding. 
<clears throat> so the set of stable brains is extremely simple. <clears throat> That's simply holomorphic Lagrangians. Um, okay. Now, quantum link invariants should also be categorified by um, the, the category of B tie brains on, on Rx or derived category of TH invariant Cartesian sheaves because uh, the link invariants can also be expressed as matrix elements of the braiding matrix uh, between pairs of conformal blocks. However, the first step is to find objects of the derived category whose vertex functions are conformal blocks or whose J functions are conformal blocks in which pairs of vertex operators fuse to trivial representation. Um, now, one way uh, of characterizing such conformal blocks is as specific eigenvectors of, of brain. This makes use of the classic result in, conform in rational conformal field theory, which is that fusion diagonalizes braiding. In, um, in, looking for, for objects, in looking for objects of the derived category uh, to serve as uh, caps and cups, we'll discover that not only braiding, but also fusion has geometric inter interpretation in terms of X, and this is new. Um, as, um, so firstly, what happens in a conformal field theory? As a pair of vertex operators approach, um, one gets a, a new natural basis of conformal blocks. Rather than um, sewing them sequentially, as we've been doing so far, it's more natural to first bring a pair of vertex operators together and sew like this instead. Uh, both choices of basis span the uh, space of conformal blocks or the space of solutions of the KZ equation, but unlike in the original basis, in the fusion basis, the braiding acts diagonally because now as you exchange, um, as, um, as you braid AI and AJ, nothing interesting happens. To, um, to discover what are the um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues of braiding, we wanna bring a pair of vertex operators close together. And as they, as, uh, as they come together, the Riemann surface develops a very long neck corresponding to um, replacing a pair of chiral vertex operators by a single one uh, by this uh, familiar formula. Because representations coloring of vertex operators are chosen to be minuscule, uh, the possible choices of fusion products are labeled by the representations that occur in the tensor product with no multiplicities on the right-hand side. It's just a fact of representation theory. Everything behaves um, like SU2. Um, fixing a, a representation, um, we get um, an eigenvector of braiding with eigenvalue determined by uh, conformal dimensions, whose um, behavior as, uh, uh, as we send a pair of um, insertions together, follows from the fusion formula, where uh, these finite uh, terms stand for terms of um, which are, which are non-vanishing and regular in the limit as AI goes to AJ. The very um, same eigenvector of braiding um, is, um, so we saw that which, ob which object you get is um, so the very same eigenvector braiding um, is um, also associated not just to a conformal block, but to its equivariant central charge counterpart and the central charge counterpart. And it's a calculation uh, which I may sketch uh, in the last lecture, in the next lecture if I if we have time. But anyway, it's in the paper that um, while conformal blocks um, that diagonalized braiding um, uh, behave like this in this familiar way as AI and AJ approach with uh, the power that's determined by the conformal dimensions. And again, from this formula, you read off the eigenvalues just by rotating 
AI and AJ around each other. Um, the equivariant central charge has a similar vanishing, um, which differs uh, by this uh, integer d here that does not depend on kappa, which you can compute. Okay, uh, because d turns out to be an integer, the equivariant central charge and the vector central charge have the same braiding as they should, right? because as I explained, braiding S in infinity, and these guys differ at the origin. Okay. Um, we get from the equivariant central charge, the ordinary central charge, simply by turning off the action that scales the homomorphic symplectic form. That corresponds to setting Q to one and sending kappa to infinity. So the ordinary central charge uh, vanishes simply like this, okay? Um, now, from perspective of X, bringing a pair of vertex operators together corresponds to a wall in the Kalin moduli where a pair of singular monopoles come together. One of the lessons of early days of mirror symmetry is that geometry of X near a point in its moduli space where um, it develops a singularity and singularities um, uh, and singularities um, happen near walls in Kalin moduli is reflected in the behavior of the central charges. So this behavior of the central charges we, that we found just uh, purely uh, algebraically from studying behavior of conformal blocks and their counterparts or um, should be reflected in the geometry. So what we expect to see is that as a pair of singular monopoles approach each other, X should develop a singularity where there's a whole collection of vanishing cycles there's a whole collection of cycles that vanish, labeled by the representations that occur in the tensor product, whose dimension is D. Because in the limit as AI and AJ approach, this formula is basically vanishing, which says the Kähler volume of, is the vanishing with the Kähler volume of the cycle, which is the distance to the power D. We have a single Kähler modula, modules in the problem that controls them. So, uh, now, let's try to find this in the geometry of X. So as monopoles collide, our X becomes a singular manifold. The reason it develops a singularity is not just that you approach a wall in, in the Kähler moduli, it's what happens at that wall. What happens at that wall is monopole bubbling. Mo monopole bubbling occurs when um, smooth monopoles concentrate at the location of a singular monopole whose charge isn't minuscule and disappear. If a singular monopole has minuscule charge, this cannot happen. But as we bring a pair of singular monopoles together, we get a monopole of non-minuscule charge um, equal to the sum of the highest weights of the, or the sum of the charges of monopoles we are bringing together. So monopole bubbling can occur. When uh, monopole bubbling occurs, some smooth monopoles bubble off, they disappear, it's, um, and leave behind um, a singular monopole of lower charge. It's kind of monopole bubbling, again, is, is described in great detail in the paper by um, Witten and Kapustin. Now, <clears throat> naively, bringing together uh, a pair of singular monopoles, we get a singular monopole of the charge, which is their sum. So, the manifold we started out with should simply be replaced by the manifold that you get by trading a pair of singular monopoles of charges mu i and mu j with a single one of charge mu i and mu j, okay? So that's a particular slice in that fine Grassmannian, which, um, which is obtained simply by uh, replacing this vector mu by uh, trading a pair of monopoles by one of charge mu ij. Now, the resulting manifold would have the same dimension as x, but um, because of possibility of monopole bubbling to occur, it has additional non-compact dimensions, non-compact directions. So while they have the same dimension, they can't, one can't be the limit of the other because uh, this guy, this guy is non-compact. It has more non-compactness than X. Okay. 
So to cure this, one compactifies by adding lower dimensional strata associated to endpoints of monopole bubbling. Uh, so the actual singular mo mo uh, manifold that you get by bringing a pair of singular monopoles together actually has, a, in general, a terrible singularity because it's a whole union of strata of different dimensions. Okay. So uh, in a given component here, fixing mu k, a certain fixed number of monopoles have bubbled off. Kapustin and Witten explained that the types of monopole bubblings that can occur are labeled by the representations in the tensor product of VI and VJ, which we'll order so that we get more monopole bubbling, more monopoles bubble off, the smaller M gets. That's what um, this means. Um, now, the structure leads to vanishing cycles we were after in the following way. A transfer slice uh, to a stratum T in the monopole moduli space, where uh, a singular monopole of charge uh, mu ij is, is replaced by a singular monopole of a lower singular monopole charge, because some monopoles have bubbled off. So the transfer slice, so the, the transfer slice to T, which is this black line, is the space W, the green space. The space W is itself modulized space of monopoles. It's the space of monopoles whose positions you need to tune so that the, the, the bubbling of that mu K can occur. So the picture is basically like this. Um, now, as we resolve singularities, to replace x check the singular x the singular manifold by the smooth one, our transfer slice also becomes smooth because we simply replace this singular space by its resolution obtained by uh, splitting uh, mu i mu j back into a, a pair. So this guy is itself a moduli space of monopoles and a baby version of it. Okay. Uh, this smooth transfer slice has a single Cayley modulus that controls relative position of, of uh, just two singular monopoles. Unlike X, it can in general have many more single, many more Cayley moduli. We're just focusing um, on a process that, that only one of them is controlled. But W has only one Cayley modulus associated to the relative position of the of, of monopoles associated to mu i and mu j. And it's a cotangent bundle to homomorphic Lagrangian. This whole morphic Lagrangian is our vanishing cycle. As uh, we bring um, mu i and mu j together, f shrinks to a point and w becomes conical w cross. Okay. So uh, these vanishing cycles come in a family uh, parameterized by t uh, with, um, because uh, w the singular W was a transfer slice to it. So we can get brains whose central charge vanishes, vanishes exactly like Z0 by um, taking a brain, which simply uh, is a structure sheaf of this vanishing cycle. It's simply a, just a brain wrapping the vanishing cycle with trivial bundle on it, together with any brain on the base T. <clears throat> um, so these brains, are objects of the derived category whose vertex functions or J functions come as close as possible to being conformal blocks in the fusion basis. Now, uh, their um, J functions have the same leading behavior as conformal blocks which diagonalize braiding. However, in general, they are subleading terms, which um, where uh, the subleading terms are terms that vanish faster, so you don't see them in the leading limit, with coefficients that are, that are rational functions of Q. So <clears throat> what's happening is that finding a set of brains whose vertex functions are exactly those conformal blocks that on the nose are eigenvectors of braiding, or equivalently, whose equivariant central charge vanishes exactly like this with no subleading terms, would require diagonalizing the action of braiding on the derived category. And even very simplest examples show that this is not possible. 
The real intuition for this is mirror symmetry, which I'll explain in the next lecture. Okay. So conformal blocks, the diagonalized braiding, don't come from any actual brains of the, of the category of B-type brains. Uh, I need a few more minutes, yeah, and we'll be finishing up. So in general, eigensheaves of braiding are rare. So um, brains on which um, braiding acts just by degree shifts. Or if you want on a conifold, if you flop, there's one brain that comes back to itself, but all the others get mixed, but others get mixed up. Right? So instead, the derived category analog, the category, the, the analog of the fact that fusion diagonalizes braiding is a filtration by the order of the vanishing of the central charge, whose terms are labeled by the fusion product. Actually, you know, uh, let's see. Good. So let me just, just finish this up and then we go. So the nth term in this filtration is the subcategory that's generated by brains whose ch central charge vanishes at least as fast as uh, the dimension of the corresponding vanishing cycle. In general, it can contain terms that vanish faster, okay? So this kind of filtration you, is induced from um, an analogous filtration on the category of, of semi-stable brains, on, on those which are the physical brains, not the topological brains. Um, uh, those, those are the brains that preserve exactly, um, the semi-stable ones are the ones that preserve exactly a you know, fixed supersymmetry. So, so a crucial property of this filtration, the reason it's interesting um, is that uh, braiding, and the reason that's analogous to the statement, its existence is analogous to the statement that fusion diagonalizes braiding is the fact that braiding preserves it. All right, so since I'm two minutes over time, and we will need this for what we'll do tomorrow, maybe now it's a good time to stop. Uh, but Mina, you actually have 60 plus five. Uh... Oh, I have plus five. Okay, then we can finish this. Yeah. Great, okay, no, very good. So, so a crucial um, property of these filtrations and the reason um, they are derived category analogs of the statement that fusion diagonalizes braiding in performal field theory is that braiding preserves the filtration. So uh, braiding, which exchanges a pair of vertex operators is a flop that trades X for X prime corresponding to two different orderings of monopoles. It's a generalized flop because unlike in the more familiar flops, say on the conifold or an A1 singularity, uh, where a single spherical cycle vanishes, which is a sphere or uh, of some sort, here we find vanishing cycles corresponding to all the representations in the tensor product and in general, they're not spherical. <clears throat> now, braiding preserves the filtration. So we get such a filtration on each side. Um, braiding preserves the filtration because it has the effect of mixing up objects of a given order of vanishing of the central charge with those whose central charge vanishes faster and which belong to the lowest or lower orders in the filtration. Again, think about, again, the intuition for this comes from mirror symmetry. Uh, and, and become more clear uh, tomorrow, but um, it's exactly as what happens on the conifold. The, the, the heavy brains get mixed up with, uh, with the light brains, um, uh, the, the, the lighter brains um, whose central charge vanishes faster. All right. So, uh, Also, this fact that um, braiding mixes up objects of one or order of uh, defiltration with those at lower orders is also reflected in the behavior of the central charges. Because while the, cent the central charge of an actual brain is not an eigenvector, it can be written as a sum of eigenvectors with some lower order terms. Okay. Um, so the variation of central charge uh, results in, uh, so what happens is that um, some central charges associated with semi-stable brains um, end up, as, as, as you go through the wall, end up entering or leaving the upper half plane simply because um, uh, the, geometric the, the, the geometric cycle flips. 
Uh, so we get a factor that takes um, the filtration on the, on, of, the, of the abelian heart to another one. Uh, again, mixing up in each order brains with the lower orders. However, on the, uh, on the, on the, um, on the, on the, on the, this is a, it's a, there's a slide missing. What happens is that, however, on the quotient subcategories where you, um, you, you look at, um, where you look at the subcategory of A sub K, uh, in which you said um, all the objects that come from lower orders to zero, that's the, the, that's the fixed graded piece. Uh, braiding acts only by the degree shifts that don't depend on the actual object, but only of the order filter of the filtration and the path around the singularity. And these degree shifts, you can read them, read them off from the central charge. Okay. So, the ex so this is um, the existence of these filtrations and their behavior on the braiding is the geometric um, or categorical origin of the statement that um, in conform of field theory, fusion diagonalized braiding. The filtrations of this type are called perverse filtrations by uh, Roque and Chuang, and um, they envision them as ways of describing derived equivalences uh, coming from variations of bridge stability conditions. But they did it largely abstractly without any examples from geometry. And here, from the monopole moduli spaces, we, we find uh, plenty of those. Okay. All right. So uh, these perverse filtrations are extremely useful in understanding what happens. To, they, they, in a very rigid way, describe what happens to the derived category as you cross the wall, as we saw here. And um, uh, in the next lecture, we'll use this um, to understand how to get link invariance. So now we stop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks very much. And uh, let's all uh, thank Mina for a very good, very clear lecture. So uh, questions from the audience? So uh, Pranav, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Mina, thanks for a very nice lecture. Um, I have a couple of different questions. Uh, so <laughs> I think the, the, the first one's related to the comment you just made uh, at the end. So um, a large part of it is, I mean, to what extent, I mean, you formulated the story in terms of the geometry of X and the mm -hmm. hypothetical geometry of X. Now, to what extent does I mean, this is slightly vague, but to what extent does it depend on the specific choice of X that you took? Oh, extremely much, right? As, uh, as this should have, um, the, hopefully the story of how, uh, you know, fusion arises should, should, um, should make it clear that it's very, very detailed information about what X is that enters. Right, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in another sense, you can, um, as you said, I mean, you can talk about a variation of bridge stability conditions and look at auto equivalences that come from um, sure. the space of stability conditions. So some part of the story is- Some uh, part of the story is general. So what happens, general. yeah, what happens here is that this is sort of the best world to understand variations of bridge stability condition because unlike say on the clinic where there are tons of you know, walls where things can happen. Here, the only place where anything can happen is when a pair of vertex operators trade places. And the basic reason is this hyperkähler geometry. So basically these spaces are like AN singularities, okay? Mm -hmm. Except that their geometry is much richer. And, uh, and unlike say, uh, you know, in the Quindic where, you know, monodromy of the, of the period matrix of the Quindic, well, it's some integer matrix, you know, here, monodromy matrices are, are given by, you know, our matrices of the quantum group, which is, you know, the, the interesting things, right? right. So, uh, have these uh, for these these categories, these equivalent categories of current sheaves? Um, is so? Is the statement here that some component of the space of bridging stability conditions is described by the positions of these? Uh, yeah, uh, I think here should be everything. It should right. be everything, right? And um, one should be able to make this precise, actually, uh, mathematically, 
I mean, mm -hmm. proving that this gives you bridge and stability condition and variations mm -hmm. is not a trivial thing, right. but they're basically baby versions of, of this, which, um, which uh, Tom Bridgeland and, uh, and, um, 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 and Richard Thomas have done in two separate papers, both mm -hmm. explicitly constructing space of brittle stability conditions on an A, or basically on AN singularities, on AD singularities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. here uh, you get a whole family and a much richer one, which is I mean, because the cycles that, that, that shrink are much more interesting, right? And, and yeah. you get this richer structure. So. so proving that you actually get a variation of, of brittle stability condition will be really you know, interesting for mathematicians. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Ashwin. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Nina. So uh, my question is about the uh, minuscule condition on mu. Uh -huh. uh, if I understood correctly, uh, you had to impose that in order for the slice in the affine Grassmannian to admit a smooth resolution. Did yes, I... that's okay. right. So. Uh, and uh, why is that important for the subsequent uh, development? Like what would happen if I pick the non-minuscule mu? Where would I run into difficulty? Well, uh, for, for X, as you can see, it looks very, very bad because what's gonna happen is that um, instead of um, you know, having a smooth manifold, it has singularities of the kind, you know, it's not like a local singularity where some cycle has shrunk. In general, you, you saw that these um, the singularities that you get are like the manifold is a union, right? It's, it's the kind of stuff we don't really like to think about, right? Um, so uh, it's possible that there's some way of curing the singularity and uh, the dealing with it, uh, uh, which may very well be true, but I, I, I just wouldn't want to uh, attempt it on, on the first try. Okay. Okay. And this choice of mu ultimately in the not theory setting. Actually, is uh, I think there, I think there is a good chance to think that maybe it's going to be okay, at least in some cases. Like for example, SU two with arbitrary representations, I think it should be okay. I think it should be okay. Uh, for example, yeah, singularities are not as bad there. I think. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I was just going to ask: Is this the mu that ultimately will enter in the? Uh, like in the Jones polynomial, uh, there's a choice of a group and an irrep. Is that the same as this mu? Uh, that's right. So the the the, the representations we're we're putting are the charges of these singular monopoles. Uh, okay. What um, the fact that we are restricting to a fixed weight subspace is sort of a technical part in the story of the Jones polynomial, which uh, you know you may miss if you if you you know if you didn't study the the problem directly, right? Uh, but it's true that, uh, that braiding acts irreducibly, for example, it's easy to show from the case equation, the braiding acts irreducibly only on the subspace of fixed weight. In terms of getting a geometric uh, picture, uh, it's quite crucial that this is true because then we can get, deal with nice spaces that you know, physicists can understand. Um, there is, um, Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did not know that the minuscule one sort of played a special role in the not theory setting. No, not for the Jones polynomial. If you just okay. want the Jones polynomial or not invariance, there's absolutely, there's very little, I think, I don't know if a special role played by the, by the minuscule representations. It's when you're trying to understand sort of the deeper structure, where, where does, you know, where does transcendence theory come from? That then somehow minuscule representations are, are, are certainly much simpler. Uh, Pranav has another question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a, a vague, slightly open-ended question. Um, mm -hmm. How does this story interact with, so when you cross walls in the space of stability conditions, there's, you know, the conservative Sobelman or Joyce Song type wall crossing phenomenon, wall crossing formula. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering how does that interact with the story that... Uh, well, in principle, uh, so what I'd like to advocate is that, um, you know, there was, uh, there are two mirror symmetry books. <laughs> there was the first one and the second one. And for, for a large part of, of my career, at least I didn't much use the second one. <laughs> didn't much think about the second one because, uh, because it's, it's very hard to understand what a derived category even is. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think that 
largely, uh, the problem is due to the fact that there are not enough interesting examples, right? And what I think will, one use of this story is that it provides plenty of really interesting examples where we do care about the answer. You know, if you made a mistake, you know, that, you know, some 13 isn't some 12 or something, you know, and uh, where basically all the questions that, that people usually ask when they ask about, uh, you know, categories of brains, variations of stability, conservatory, subliminal war crossing can be asked here, right? But, and they should have nice answers. Um, I don't know if all questions, but many should. As um, okay. it's yeah. a test case where you can check whether also, yeah, you just yeah. You can actually compute things and check that everything works out. So I, I guess next time you're going to be also be telling us about an A model incarnation of this whole story. So is that from yes, that? that's right. I'll, I'll I'll finish up a little bit about how uh, how how we get not invariance from B type brains, and then we talk about the A model. And actually, the story is a little bit backwards because the A model is actually in the end, easier to understand. Uh, however, um, the construction of which theory one studies would, would largely sound, I think, unmotivated if one didn't know about the B side first. And, and actually knowing mirror symmetry was absolutely crucial in understanding that you wouldn't, <laughs> I, I think people have tried and it's very easy to sort of not understand the category of A-brains. And the fact that it's solvable, understanding that it's actually solvable and actually much simpler than what happens on the B side Somehow, mirror symmetry was very crucial to understand that. Okay. Uh, any other last question for Mina? Uh, so on. Mm. Okay. In any case, we are uh, over the time and we have another talk starting in less than 15 minutes. Uh, so we'll have a break now, but let's thank uh, Mina again and uh, look forward to our next lecture. Thank you for joining.